Hey everyone, Delta9 here from Johnny Tactical. It's a company I created for the sole purpose of making law enforcement better from within and safer from without. We're helping you take your work seriously, but not yourself. You can follow us on social media at Facebook and Instagram. And you can also check out more about what we do at our website, which is johnnytactical.org. In this video, I'll be giving you 10 tactical tips for a better police life. Check it out and make sure you stay till the end for a bonus tip. The element of surprise all starts with an early morning brief. Being on time and ready for a couple of hours worth of work means you need something that's quick, that's easy, definitely that's caffeinated, and that will keep you from getting hungry when it's most inconvenient. I learned about Bulletproof Coffee from a friend of mine who's an ultra marathon runner, so I figured if it's good enough for a guy who runs 100K, it's good enough for a SWAT operation. And since it's so easy, I can prep everything the night before, and then when I roll out of bed in the morning at zero dark 30, I just throw everything in the blender, and I can take it with me, drink it on the way, and finish it up in the brief, which is, as we all know, death by PowerPoint. So I'm gonna show you how to make it, what those ingredients are, coming up. So it sounds like the coffee is done. You're just gonna need brewed coffee, unsalted grass-fed butter, coconut oil, and a blender. Put everything into the uh, blender cup and then we'll fire it up. One tablespoon of grass-fed butter, one tablespoon of coconut oil, and coffee. Bulletproof coffee. All right, Bulletproof coffee is keto friendly if you're into that kind of thing. But what you do need to know is it's got good fats in it from the butter and the coconut oil that will keep you from getting hungry and give you sustained energy. It's easy to make, give it a whirl. All right, another option to Bulletproof coffee is overnight oats, or as I like to call them, tactical oats. It's also going to give you sustained energy, easy to make. You can prep it ahead of time and grab it and go when it's time to head out in the morning. So you're going to need the uh, mason jar. This is a 12 and a half ounce mason jar. A cup of oats. Use about two tablespoons of chia seeds. A tablespoon or two of peanut butter. A cup of milk. And then you add maple syrup, however sweet you like it. Funnel's helpful, less mess in the kitchen. Add your oats, add your chia seeds. I'll uh, do two tablespoons. These are a superfood. The milk, and your milk is going to be equal to your oats, so even if you use less oats, use less milk. So one cup of milk. Peanut butter. Good hefty whoop, tablespoon of peanut butter. And then maple syrup. I do about two blurbs, it's like probably a teaspoon and a half, maybe a tablespoon. Seal that baby off, give it a mix, and you put it in the fridge overnight, it'll be ready for you in the morning. Or if you didn't do it ahead of time, what you can do is use quick cooking oats and these will be ready in like 50. <coughs> I'm gonna show you how to tie your shoes like a tactical athlete. I know, I know. You're probably thinking, but Delta 9, I've been tying my own shoes since I was 14 years old. Why should I change now? Because Grasshopper, this is a better way. It doesn't matter if you're wearing dress shoes for court, your shoes for gym or out for a run, or your super sexy tactical operator boots for your next SWAT call up. Nobody likes a big, bulky knot that's difficult to untie. This knot that I'm going to show you is a smaller knot. It stays tied all day long and it's easy to tie, easy to remember. So here's how you do it. All right, so once you've laced up your boot or shoe, grab your laces and it's going to be left over right two times. One, two. Snug it up, form two bows. Now it's going to be right over left two times. One, two. 
pull the loops and snug up the knot and just make your adjustments to even out the uh, ends of the laces. Pull, snug it up. And when you look down at your knot, you should see these two parts of the laces parallel to one another. Now you have a nice even knot, a nice even bow. And then to undo it, all you need to do is pull the ends, just like a regular bow. And it'll come untied. And that is how you tie your shoe like a tactical athlete. Is there anything more annoying and painful than when your neck hairs get snagged on the lanyard of your neck badge? It's awful. I hate it. Well, it's time to save yourself some pain. Check this out. All right, now to take care of those pesky neck hair pullers. So most standard badge holes come with this kind of chain. It's almost like a dog tag chain. So what we're gonna do is to stop it from yanking our neck hairs is cut a length of paracord. I know, I know haters, you're saying paracord, paracord makes everything tactical. Well, it's true. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to measure our paracord. So it's same length as our badge chain and we just cut it. Paracord is essentially two parts, a, a core and an outer, almost like a sleeve. And all we're gonna do is decore it by pulling out the inner strands. Okay, we're just gonna decore it. We're gonna take all the strands out. Okay, so now that that core is out, we just take our neck badge chain, pass it through. This is gonna take a little while. Okay, you can pass it through the way I showed you, or according to Mrs. Delta 9, if you have some crafty sewing people in there, uh, just take one of the strands from the core that you just removed, use one of these things, thread it, tie the other end to the chain, and then use this guy, push it through. Wow, Mrs. Delta 9, that worked really well. So once you get it all the way through, just reconnect it to your badge and clasp it underneath. Now you might be saying, well, why don't I just use straight paracord? Well, these things are designed to break away. For some reason you were to get into some kind of situation where your neck badge got hung up on something, this would at least break away. Whereas if you just do paracord and tie a knot, that's gonna hold a lot of weight. I think this is like 550 pounds, which is why they call it 550 paracord. So you don't wanna do that. That's why passing this through um, is gonna be a better option. All right, one last thing to note is these chains come pretty long. So long, in fact, that some of these will be hanging down by your belly button, depending on how tall you are. If you notice in your uniform, your badge is like right here on your chest. Well, this neck chain, you can actually trim it down. Just get some wire snips and shorten it so that it hangs somewhere right around your breastbone. That way it's elevated and it's gonna be in view of other officers. If you're plain clothes or you're off duty, you want other officers to recognize you as the police and you don't want your neck badge so long that it's hanging someplace where somebody's not gonna see it. So just take the time when you're doing this to trim this chain down so it hangs right around your breastbone, right around the area of your heart. Just don't make it too small because you won't get to fit your big head through this. Uh, you don't wanna do that. So just eyeball it, snip it, do your paracord, and then bye-bye neck hair pain. Well, that was easy. Your neck hairs will thank you, and you can thank me too. Adrenaline dumps are your body's way of preparing itself to get some action. And once adrenaline enters your bloodstream, you're gonna have an elevated heart rate, and you're going to need the oxygen to keep up with that flow of blood. So your breathing then increases, um, and then you're gonna get that feeling of uh, adrenaline and it's gonna feel like nerves. And so one of the ways to combat that and to calm yourself down is through something called tactical breathing, also known as combat breathing. I came across this uh, several years ago, it was introduced to me and it works. It's really simple, it's easy to remember and you don't have to be in a yoga studio to do it. And it's just simply this. It's breathing in through the nose for four seconds, holding for four seconds, breathing out through the mouth for four seconds, holding for four seconds. So it sounds something like this. 
In through the nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out through the mouth, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. Just like that. You do a couple cycles of that and you're gonna feel more calm. You're gonna feel less of that adrenaline sensation and it'll get you ready for what you have to do next. Are your keepers, cuff cases, magazine pouches giving you trouble? I've been there, I understand. Well, fear not, this no name brand chapstick lip balm thing is the solution. All right, so here's my standard issue duty belt. And if you've got a cuff case or a keeper that's really difficult to unsnap, like this one is, it's a little stiff. All you gotta do is take your non-name brand lip balm and just apply a little bit around the edge of the snaps. Like that. Work it in a little bit. All right, so after you've worked it in, no more stuck snaps. One other thing to throw in there, if you keep having your keepers pop off while you're getting in and out of your cruiser, I know how annoying that can be. If you look at these keepers here, they're pointed down. What you wanna do is just simply turn them around. If all your keepers are facing up, they are far less likely to come unsnapped when you're getting in and out of the cruiser because there's nothing, no seat cushion or anything pushing up on them that will pop them off. Have all your keepers facing up and it will keep them from coming undone. All right, once you've applied that around the edge of each of your snaps, problem solved. Next. Do you suffer from droopy brass? Hey! Huh? I said droopy brass, not droopy. Oh man. Well, nothing says soup sandwich like brass drooping off your uniform and hanging crooked. And nothing's more aggravating than when it comes time for uniform changeover from like summer to winter or winter to summer or for the special occasions and you've got to change your brass from one uniform shirt to another and it takes forever. Well, I've got a solution for you. It's cheap, it's quick, it's easy. Check this out. All right, so this is how you say goodbye to droopy brass and have a squared away uniform. So whatever you got for brass here, and I know some of your uniforms, you guys look like third world dictators or generals with all your brass on there. And what can happen is the gap and the weight of the brass makes it droop and hang off the uniform, it looks terrible. So what we have you do is create a backer for it, just out of simple cardboard. Okay, so remove your backers and then get your pins lined up where you want them. You want the spaces in between each pin about equal and then running parallel and of course in the order of your department's SOP. And then get yourself a uh, piece of cardboard. Cardboard comes in different thicknesses, believe it or not, and you wanna find thinner piece of cardboard. So it's like almost essentially like a one ply piece of cardboard. And then all you're gonna do is you're gonna mark out your brass. And so you get an idea of how big your backer is gonna be, and then just cut it out. So now I've cut my piece of cardboard to size. I already have my pins in place. I'm going to slide this in behind and then press my pins through. Take your pins off, um, start with the bottom most pin, center it as best you can on your uniform, parallel to whatever comes first. For us, it's our name tag, which goes on our pocket. I don't put a backer on this because it's already going through like three layers of fabric. And then we'll start placing the cardboard behind the bottom most pin. You're gonna press your first pin through, whatever pin that is, and you're just gonna eyeball it. There's gonna be some trial and error, and then go to your next pin. And so your goal is to keep it parallel and centered. And again, it might take some trial and error to get it to line up the way you like it. Okay, so just hang your shirt on a hanger, take your time lining everything up, press it through the cardboard, put the backers on, and it'll look like this from the back. And if you get overlap on your other um, pin backers, just trim it off. 
no one's ever going to see it or know that it's there. And then from the front, you're going to have a nice, sharp, clean looking uniform and no more droopy brass. Alright, so how you carry a secondary weapon in patrol matters. I've often seen guys carry knives, or girls, carry knives in one of their pockets, exposed and visible to the general public. Now, when you're in uniform, I think it's completely different than when you're walking around town in your jeans and a t-shirt off duty and you've got a pocket knife. I carry one, I mean obviously they're a great tool to have, you should have one with you, but in patrol I think there's a big difference and that difference primarily is if you get into a scuffle, it goes to the ground, or you end up in some kind of a wrestling match, you are trained primarily to protect your pistol. Not so much a secondary weapon like a knife. Here are the most common places I see other officers carry their pocket knives. Obviously in their pants pocket, pants pocket, flashlight pocket, back pocket. These are the most common places that they carry them and they're the most accessible to a bad guy in a wrestling match. If you're in a traditional uniform with a vest underneath and a uniform shirt on top, what I recommend is carrying your knife on one of your vest straps. It's easy to get to, it's much more likely that you're going to use your knife as a tool, not as a weapon. So in my opinion, it's better to have it out of sight and out of mind where you can get at it reasonably well, reasonably easy, but it's out of sight of the bad guy he won't know it's there, so therefore he can't try to get his hands on it. So the reason I keep it on my vest strap, I'm a righty, so it's on my left side, is if I'm in uniform, and I'll show you that in just a second, I can just reach my hand in, get it out, use it, whatever I need to do with it, and then I can put it back in pretty easily. So I'll show you that right now. Okay, so when you're in your traditional police uniform with vest underneath, shirt on top, this is an older version of a uniform shirt which actually has real buttons. Most of the new ones have zippers which makes it even easier. But all I have to do to get out my knife is unbutton one button, slide my hand in, pull it out, use the knife for whatever I need to do with it, and then I put it away in reverse. It goes right on my vest strap, I button my uniform shirt up, and nobody knows it's there except me, which I think is the most important part. All right, one of the other important pieces of gear that you need to carry with you all the time is a tourniquet. Hopefully your department issues you one. If not, you can buy them online for like somewhere around $30, somewhere around there. You've got to have it with you, not just with you, but in a place that you can reach it, a place that you can get at it easily, and then have it staged so that when you need it, you can pull it out and put it on without having to fight the Velcro. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. All right, so to properly stage your tourniquet, you want to first by prep it by starting it through um, the slot and the buckle so that you have a loop and this is your free flowing loop that can slide in and out and then what I want you to do turn it over and so we're gonna make a handle almost like a lasso and you can see mine's already bent just from being like that for so long but I'm gonna find a length that's about the length of my grip that's about this length of my grip and I'm going to fold it over itself. Slippery side out, Velcro in. Now I'm going to bring the buckle up, the end of the fold. And I just want to get it started. Like that. About an inch of Velcro from here to here. This is attached. This is still open and loose. Well, if you can see, we have a lasso basically shape started. This is my handle here. This is my loop. Now I'm going to fold it so smooth to sticky, sticky to smooth. This way it won't Velcro to itself and then this is how I'm going to store it. Secondly, um, the tab here, after you turn the windlass and you stop the flow of blood, that's when you know it's tight enough. The windlass goes inside here and then this goes over the windlass to keep it from popping out. When you stage it, what you don't want is you don't want to stage it this way and, and carry it around like this because you won't be able to turn the windlass with this in the way. So you want to stage it with this backed off, Velcro it here, but leave a flap that you can grab so that after the windlass is turned, it sits in here, you have a tab to grab, and then you can secure the windlass that way. 
And so once we have it stored properly, so that when we take it out, we can, we can use it easily and it's not bound up on itself, it opens up. I'm going to grab the handle that I created and I can slide my arm through or if it's my leg and then I only have to defeat one inch of Velcro to get it to tighten. So I just pull and now the Velcro is defeated and I can apply the tourniquet and then close off the windlass. So the reason why it's stored that way is because that creates a handle which we leaves a loop like a lasso. All I have to do is slip it over my arm and pull. And I'm only defeating one half inch of Velcro and it will go right on and it's in the correct position. And then I crank it on, make sure your uh, tourniquet as always is high and tight to stop the flow of blood and, um, and that's how you do it. So next I'll show you uh, how to store it on your belt or your vest. So once you have your tourniquet staged properly, it doesn't have to be this way, but this is again, this is a way of doing it to make sure that it doesn't bind up on you when you need it. You need to store it on your belt or your vest or someplace that is easily accessible. Now they make all kinds of tourniquet pouches and holders out there that you can get, that's totally fine. But one way to do it is with a little bit of shot cord and a barrel lock. Similarly to the video, the key to the city that uh, I released earlier, uh, I show you how to use this type of device to secure your pry bar to your vest. Well, you can do the same thing with your tourniquet to your belt. So if you've got real estate on your belt, like this is about the center of my back where I can reach it with both hands, all you gotta do is place the loop behind your belt and then the tourniquet goes on top. And you're just gonna pass tourniquet through the loop like this on one end and over the other end and then you cinch it up and it's just basically bungee and this little barrel lock guy and this will stay put and when you need it you can really just yank it and it'll pop right out of the, the shock cord you can put it on your belt but if you like don't have enough real estate maybe you're real skinny or your department issues a whole bunch of stuff you don't have room on your belt you can actually do the same thing on your holster. So either your taser holster or your firearm holster, if you don't have any other place to put it, you can do the same method around the holster and position your tourniquet, you can position it on your taser holster like that, and then the pistol holster like that, simply by passing this loop through. You may need to cut a longer length of, of shock cord to make this distance, but essentially it would go on the same way. You can put it here, you can put it over here on your taser holster or on your belt. And that's one way, easy way to carry it. It's inexpensive um, and simple to do. And it works really, really well. You can also do this with Molly. You can slip this through your Molly and attach it the same way. Or if you've got just a few strips of webbing or something of that nature, or even like a shoulder strap, like an applet on your vest or your, your, your uniform shirt, you can pass it through um, and keep your tourniquet secure that way. After 10 years of total time on the SWAT team, I've made plenty of mistakes, forgotten plenty of things, or been in a situation where I wish I had something that I didn't have on me. With these 10 things in your kit, you're ready for the next call that doesn't go as planned. So these are 10 things that you should carry on your kit, whether it be your vest or a separate pouch that you carry, like on a thigh rig or a belt or it could even be like your go bag or your cruiser bag. And this will help you through like a sustained call out. Maybe you get stuck on a perimeter somewhere unexpectedly. And th these things will help get you through most of those situations. So the first one we have is, um, we've got like an energy drink, a power bar, protein. So that's in case you get stuck somewhere for four, five, six, seven hours and you don't have access to food or water. This is a door wedge. This is a fancy uh, high-speed wedge used for chalking doors. You can prop them open, wedge them shut, and it's handy to have on you. And if you don't want to spend money on a custom, professionally made one, you can actually just cut them out of wood and just carry one or two wooden wedges with you. It's just basically a doorstop. Trauma shears, of course, are very important in case you've got to treat yourself or somebody else. It'll prevent them from getting cut. You can easily cut through their clothing um, to give them medical aid. And if you use weird colored handles, people are less likely to steal them, so that's good. Pry bar, uh, if you've watched one of my previous videos, The Key to the City, I recommend a pry bar. This is one that I made early on. It's got quite a bit of use to it, and 
It is wrapped in paracord, but I also added friction tape on the outside, just to keep the paracord from fraying and all that. Speaking of paracord, you should keep a length with you. Uh, some of the comments that I had in the last video, Key to the City, people talked about, well, what about taking the paracord off the handle to, you know, use? I think survivor bracelets and those kinds of things make everybody think paracord, that means I have to unravel to use it. Well, no, you can just carry a length of it, it doesn't take up much room in your kit. And this is good for tying off doors, modifying entry tools like mirrors and those kinds of things. Sometimes they break or you need to make them longer so you've got to tie them together. Paracord is really good. Medical, of course, uh, tourniquet. Make sure you carry your tourniquet with you. Make sure it's properly staged. Sharpie marker. Permanent marker is super important. Especially like, for example, if you go to a school shooting and you're clearing a lot of rooms and you need to mark doors or mark hallways or mark places that you've checked or haven't been checked or what they need, you can do that with the Sharpie just by writing on the door or the wall. It's good to have one of those with you. Folding knife, like a pocket knife. This is a knock around um, folding knife. You just It's a good utility tool to have, not necessarily as like a defense weapon, but it's more like a tool for cutting paracord, modifying things, you just never know. Pocket knives are indispensable. And then last is rubber gloves because people are gross. We don't want to touch them. We don't want to get blood contaminants on us or anybody else, so make sure you carry gloves with you. So those are the 10 things that I carry. Um, let me know what you carry in your kit. Thanks. So you want to up your tactical game? What you need is a tactical beard. Can't grow one? No problem. Order one online today. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and share it with others because I depend on you to grow my audience, to get the message of Johnny Tactical out there. Um, and just remember, Johnny Tactical exists to make law enforcement better from within and safer from without while helping you take your work seriously, but not yourself. Until next time. And then fart again. Double <laughs> online. Hey, does anybody have a wedge? You can say, I got a wedge. You know what I mean? And I am in a rambling. Yeah. Thread it. Tie the other. <laughs> <coughs> I've given you a hard time. <laughs> I can't.